uh, with the adult and young population uh, being around 42 uh, 179 percent 179,000 and it accounted for 42 percent of the new infections uh, we had other uh, the adult HIV prevalence was 3.2 percent uh, from the demographies of the county we have a transnational highway that contributes a lot because it comes from Mombasa all the way to Cairo so there are a lot of uh, the key populations are lined up along that transport corridor our health facilities are around 236 and our art sites were 73. so what we sought to do was to sort of link these facilities have a visibility of how they're doing have an end-to-end -end visibility from the national the taiwan supplier from the warehouse when these drugs are procured how are they delivered who is the transporter? What the condition are they getting to the, uh, the ART site? How is it dispensed to the patient? Does it go and get to the right patient at, in the desired time? So next slide. So the background, we did a situation analysis. So the past challenges in the supply chain uh, included that lack of an end-to-end -end supply chain visibility that we could not tell where these drugs are because we get our supplies at the end of the month after we've done our reports. So uh, looking at it, especially right now when we have very extreme weather conditions, we had floods, we even had some areas cut off. It was so key to know uh, when will this consignment get to the health facility. So this visibility gives us an end to end when the drugs left the warehouse. In case of an interruption, what can we do? And now it also safeguards the patients to know which buffer stocks can we do to sustain them that they don't get missed pills. We also have to use the same to base on redistribution if need be. So there was also poor forecasting and quantification. We found that uh, facilities were holding more than they could. Remember this intervention we, we implemented in the law facility, like the level two and level three and a few level four facilities, just to have a feel of the community. And so remember these uh, communities uh, sometimes they tend to overkeep commodities so that patients have that feel that their facility is well is well equipped whereas it's not the norm i feel like we should just keep what you need and give out what you you can't take so there was also poor utilization of stock management and we had poor reporting rates and also delayed reports and there were expired vital commodities especially this was for the rtks next slide so the methodology, that, the strategy that we uh, applied was this innovative uh, stock visibility system. Uh, in April 2022, uh, the Afio activity, uh, which was supported by USAID through PEFA, uh, was our implementing partner. And uh, they partnered with the, the Department of Health for Makwini County. And we were piloting this outsourced last mile distribution and stock visibility system. It was dubbed the SVS for stock visibility. So we did uh, a one week data collection through the facilities that was around 24th to 20th of April. We did 120, remember uh, that was like 50% of our health facilities, just to pick out the main supply chain challenges that we experienced. Then we did narrow down to the, our sample size now, and we did the stock verification for the particular facilities, and we onboarded them on the app. Uh, the application was a vendor off the shelf. It was available on uh, the Play Store, but not on iOS. But uh, yeah, so we onboarded around 22 facilities, both level two, three, and uh, two level four facilities. So next slide. So uh, the key findings, as we had found, that uh, were a challenge to the supply chain. We had an updated stock cards. People, uh, most healthcare workers didn't have requisite knowledge on stock management. Remember, most were not trained commodity managers. So we had an updated stock cards. We also had unusable commodities, which are either damaged expired we also had uh, phased out regimens uh, especially tle remember if evidence had been phased out but they had not uh, fully disposed the, the pharmaceutical waste so we had large quantities of commodities also with near six months to expiry which is uh, a risk to the inventory we had discrepancies between the physical stock and the, uh, the bean card quantities where they they use physical bean cards and also the inventory where they have an hmis there was also lack of verification of the received commodities. Commodities are supplied from uh, the national warehouse. When they get to the facility, 
there's no documentation of the same. We also had overstocked or understocked or stocked out commodities. And then last, there was poor documentation on the requisitions. Our requisitions are a government uh, uh, legal document that we use to transfer commodities in between facilities or within the same facility, maybe from one department to another. Next slide. So this was a projection of the anomalies that we found. We did the counts. So we did, uh, we found there's discrepancy between the physical stock and what was available on the cards. And also delivery, there was anomaly in the delivery for some of the facilities. Next slide. So what were the, next slide. So what are the key supply chain indicators that we had to address? We had to address the central warehouse availability. We could not know. Like right now, um, as we, we gear up to maybe um, rolling out something like uh, tough when it comes, do we know is it available at the central warehouse? That is the KEMSA or the MEDS? Do we have, what is the adoption rate? What are the anomalies rates? How is the stock verification rates at our facilities? Which are the stocks that are delivered? What are the products that are at risk? What is the stock in transit that is due to be delivered? And what is the stock that is expiring in six months? Next slide. Next. So this is how the app looked like. It was an Android app. So I took a few screenshots, as you can see from the main menu. It had the option to do facility stock verification. Uh, there's a received verification once you get the commodities from the supplier. There's a view records that we had the facility details. So that was the home screen. Then we had the stock recording method. There's an option to scan a barcode of the commodity once it reaches you, or also you can do it manually if you don't have a smartphone. So we had to integrate, as we had from yesterday, the fight is not only on HIV, we have to integrate malaria, family planning, and uh, nutrition products. So we captured both. Uh, we, we did both for, not both for family planning, for HIV, for lab, for the test kits, and malaria. So the stock items that were listed, uh, but some, but a few to show. So when you click, uh, maybe on family planning, there's a drop down of the commodities that are available. The, the, you click on the HIV, there's a drop down list of what is available. So maybe that was not captured. But uh, there's an option to select your stock to update. So you, you can proceed to do your physical stock counts once you receive. You can proceed to do your transactional stock. Transactional stock is where you move your commodities maybe from the central uh, stores to the dispensing pharmacy or from one facility to another, such. So next slide. Uh, next, no, back. Uh, so here is what we, we used to do. I, I took an example of maybe the address of commodity like TND 90s. Uh, so we are doing the current stock level is indicated somewhere. You can see the expiry date is well captured and the batches that are available. So we emphasized on the good practice of FIFO and FEFO. What is first in, first out. What is first expiry goes first. So we also were capturing anomalies. Anomalies would occur either due to human error, due to the transporter during the process, and this is where we're looking at it. Is it what left the central warehouse? Is it what got to the facility? So there was a, a prioritization, how you could prioritize your anomalies. Was it badly off? Did you miss uh, maybe 10 cartons, one carton or something like that? And then we captured the stock transactions that is uh, between the facility and intra, intra and inter facility. Then the, the tool was also able to uh, quantify the average monthly consumption. That means, at the dashboard, you could tell which facility is overstocked, which is understocked, so you make key decisions on redistribution and what not to order during the ordering cycle. Next slide. Uh, yeah, that is something like how deliveries appear. <clears throat> so deliveries, up. Uh, we worked with the Taiwan supplier, that is the national supply agencies, which are mainly two in Kenya, Kems and Meds. So once the, the orders have been allocated, the supplier would feed the delivery notes on the on the system. So when you receive them, they are already preloaded. You just have to counter check what you receive. Next. So this is how the dashboard looked like. Uh, it shows you the national, it's an end to end. We're trying to get an end to end process from the, uh, the tier one warehouse 
the distribute the supplier up to the last point where the patient gets the drug. So you can see somewhere there's warehouse availability, it was around 59% at that point. Facility availability was around 86%. So it has all the categories. How much of what of family planning commodities are available at the central warehouse and how many we are holding at our facilities. So this is just data from some of the facilities and also for some of the commodities. Next slide. So that is a dashboard of the facilities. Remember we had 22. So from it, you can generate reports. You can look at the adoption rate. You can look at the anomalies, are they, are they discrepancies? And also you can do the receipts verification. Do they verify once they receive the commodities? Next, uh, that's our facility distribution. So if we could zoom in, but uh, we have like expired. At the point of inception, you'll realize we had many expired commodities. This was a custom due to the first out regiments like TLE. And also we had short expiring uh, oral test kits, which contributed to a large inventory cost being expired. So this was one of the key interventions that needed to be done. Why were we expiring kits while other people could make use of same? So that is some snapshot of the dashboard. So next slide. So what was the overall impact on the supply chain? So very, as I have said, uh, there was ease in forecasting and ordering. We had data-driven ordering. So we were not, the healthcare workers were not just ordering on impulse or bias. So it was purely on science and data. Next. So like this was our stocks for, you can see the trend since uh, implementation and after implementation, we really kept a very minimal inventory cost. I think after March, after the piloting, maybe people uh, went back to normal, but we kept a very lean inventory at that point. Next. Uh, so we also had the impact on expiries. We, before the rollout, as I have said, we had many expired uh, commodities, but during our period, we just reduced that to at least 50%. Next. So that was as at March. Uh, then next, you can see as at December, we had really kept our inventory very, very lean with long expiries. And also, we could consume all that was in the short expiry period. Next. So in December, uh, our inventory went up a bit higher. But remember, there was still long within six months to expiry, which we could also consume, especially for HIV. TB program has had a challenge. As you can see, uh, we don't really have uh, supplies. As Malaria, we are a low endemic zone. So we only get malaria cases which are transient. Uh -huh. That's why you only keep very few doses for the, the patients, especially those are along the major highways, facilities along the major FP, it's supplied after three months. So that's why it only appears uh, transit. We order after three months cycle. So next, we had uh, the impact of stockouts that we've talked about. We were able to reduce the stockouts, especially for tracer commodities like on the first line TND from 24% to 3%. For the HIV right. case, from 53% uh, to 48%. So next, reporting rates and the utilization of the reporting tools. So from the facility consumption data, we moved from 15, 95% to 98%. Uh, this is because we're doing this by monthly verification. Every 15th and every end of month, we were doing our verification. And this kept the top of mind reporting. Next. So that's uh, maybe a snapshot of our reporting rates. You can see move from red to green and up for all the tracer, for all the commodities. Next, uh, that's our service data, which was around 100%. We, we moved from November around 92 and we're closing at 100%. Next, uh, that's the facility consumption data report. Also, there was a steady increase, as you can see. Uh, next. Uh, the overall impact on the community health strengthening, we realized that it impacted positively on the diagnosis. Uh, remember, we're doing the 95, 95, 95. So we, we were able to get the right kits, which had the right shelf life. We also got the right commodities, which had the right shelf life, and reached the patient in the right uh, quality. So differentiated care patients, we were able to sort them with uh, those uh, with long field rates because we could order drugs that had longer shelf life. 
and also on the treatment outcomes that was impacted also positively. So next, the challenges that we had uh, was just uh, some some places lacked uh, the stable internet connection, and sometimes you have difficulty difficult terrains like I explained earlier. So some some facilities might be hard to reach, especially during the rainy season. So we also realized there was high staff turnover, which also affected our reporting rates and our adoption for the tool. Uh, next, so the lessons that we learned, this is a useful tool. Uh, it can help with the uh, end-to-end uh, stock visibility. And it also gives you a very big analysis to help you make informed decisions. Uh, we have the dashboard, which was easy to calculate the commodity fill rates and after given supply. So we had a stable supply chain cycle. So it's, it's key to learn that a robust supply chain is uh, very essential in the continuity of care. And also having such community innovations that are centered and tailored to the needs of a community is very key in, in strengthening this uh, fight against uh, AIDS. So we also need the buy-in from the top leadership because this is policy implementation just to take up these innovations. They're simple, they're cheap, because despite, uh, uh, apart from the cost of uh, the handset, the other cost that was incurred was data. Yeah, so we, we need to hold up and take up these solutions. Next, so the areas for improvement, we need to interoperab uh, interoperability between the existing uh, health management systems, create uh, a web-based version, and also improve the data, the dashboard for easier visualization. Next. So I want to thank uh, the partners who made this possible, USAID, PEFA, the government of Kenya, and the county government of Makuini, and all those people who are involved in this study. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, uh, Sila. Uh, supply chain is the bloodstream of the health system. And uh, Sila has really outlined for us some of the issues that we are aware of already, the challenges uh, in, 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 the, uh, the man in managing stock and the challenges that come with supply chain leading to stock out at the last mile. The innovation that he, he showed here is very, very useful. Uh, and uh, I'd like to highlight how it solved the problem of aspiration of commodities in the, in the storeroom, uh, overstocking of supplies at one health facility at the same time having stock up at another health facility. So thank you very much. Uh, you recall that uh, at the beginning, uh, carrying started and we still had, we had technology problem so that the slide could not show. We have uh, uh, five, four minutes to end this session uh, and we have discussion to do. So. I want to go through democratic process here. If we can get uh, as part of the discussion to get Karen to highlight a few, few slides here for us, and, and then we go into the, into the discussion. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, please. All right. You're, you're going to get the speed dating version. <laughs> I'm not, I promise I won't speak through all the slides um, over again. So I'm going to be saying next a lot. But I think just in terms of honoring the team that worked on this, uh, a lot of people, the project coordinator, privileged chair Sheka, and of course the community outreach agents and all the teams. So next, please. And this is a taster. So if you want to have the full slide deck and really go through the different um, pieces of evidence that I discussed, um, please see me after and I can always email it to you. So these are some of our community outreach agents next. So this is giving you some, a few visuals from the Boost application. So it's very visual. Um, it's it's uh, simplified. It's not using a lot of jargon. Uh, we all know that distilling some of our uh, evidence-based guidelines, the biggest challenge is making it meaningful uh, and approachable for our community health workers. Next, please. And it was also to show that the application is not just using, it's not just talking about HIV and STIs. It's also talking about substance misuse and um, uh, relationships, uh, PEP. So uh, I really encourage, there's over 50 different topics on the application. And again, it's available offline. Next, please. So I don't need to speak to that, I don't think, because I described it in my talk, but 
there's some of our community outreach agents using the application. And please come. I think we're booth 72 at OFID. We've got COAs there. Uh, and they can demonstrate the application. They can screen you if you'd like to be screened. Um, but I, the, my only warning is that you'll feel very uncool when you see them because they're very cool young people uh, and they can really provide information in a very compelling way. Thanks, thanks. So that's the transect walk. I, I, I described that, but I, anybody wants some more information? I'm happy. Next, please. So I'm not going to go through the data slides because that will take too much time. And I think we should get to questions because to honor the other uh, presenters who had such great presentations. But um, this is just to show the different age groups from the total screenings. Next. This is the HIV testing, noted, noting that 20 to 24 year old age group that appears to be we're missing them somehow. And there's uh, more that we need to do. Next, please. And then in the self-test kit distribution, in the pink is the community, and on, in the blue is the facility. And you can see that increasing rise that I described on community-based HIV self-test kit distribution, because they're the ones doing the screening. Next, please. Uh, th I, this is the um, uh, cascade, which I described with a 6% positivity rate and the 87% uh, results shared with service providers in the community. Next. There's our red flag that we have a lot more work to do on. There was an excellent session yesterday with uh, Global Fund discussing HIV and STI integration with BRTI. Uh, and we all agree that we're not doing enough in this area and that it's going to be you know, a critical area for not just epidemic control, but the health of our young people and populations. And you can see it's not just the screening, so it's not overly biomedicalized, but it's, there's information that can be provided at the point of screening as well in a very visual way. Next. Uh, here's the mental health and with our red flag again amongst the 20 to 24 year olds uh, for uh, generalized anxiety or depression needing for community-based referrals. Next. So this is, again, just where I wanted to end, that it's feasible, acceptable, and again, to highlight, this is very pragmatic use um, in, in the facilities, and also to um, you know, invite everybody to come to the OFID booth 72 uh, to really meet the COAs themselves and hear from them. Nobody wants to hear from me. Hear from them um, how they use the tool and, and how uh, it's impacted their communities. And also to flag on Friday, there is also information about uh, female genital schistosomiasis, which is also an under-addressed um, issue uh, um, among adolescent girls and young women and women in general. Uh, and my colleague Privilege will be giving a presentation on lessons that we've had about using Boost to raise awareness, awareness about FGS. Um, that's on Friday from uh, 2.10. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. I hope that was a good uh, speed date. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, uh, Karen. Uh, colleagues, from what I observe here from these presentations, the three presentations and the three uh, technologies and uh, intervention approaches shared with us here are really complementary. They can, they have synergies, and I can see that if they are applied jointly in, in, in a coverage area, it can really bring tremendous uh, change. More importantly is the integration aspect and the community engagement aspect. So uh, the floor is now opened for discussion. Thank you. Uh, before that, let, let's give a, 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 a hand of applause to our, our presenter. I think they have done very well by sharing with us what they are doing. Thank you. Okay, the floor is open for discussion. Is there someone to moderate the question? I see a hand there. I'll look around, look around first. Any more? OK, let's go. Uh, thank you to the presenters. My question is to the last presenter on the Boost tool. I come from TB, and I'm just worried that uh, you have got a nice uh, community tool, but it's not integrating uh, TB despite we in Zimbabwe, being a hybrid and TB country, perhaps you could just comment on what are the plans, if any, to include TB.
the answers will overlap from the presenter. NMO. Okay, we we'll call on Karen to save time in the interest of time. We'll call on Karen. Thank you. I recognize our TV leaders in the room. Um, absolutely. And I think this is one of the interesting things about digital. It's adaptable, right? We can add in screening tools. It can be adapted to country context. In Zimbabwe, we have translated into Shona and Debele. We can add additional screening tools. So we can add symptom screening algorithms uh, into this. It was This is a learning phase, I would call it. Um, and what we're really wanting to do is now bring it to Ministry of Health and Child Care, uh, for review and endorsement. But first we had to learn and correct. We didn't want to bring uh, something in progress. But certainly you can add um, really as many screenings as, as we wanted to, but we wanted to um, focus it in the context of HIV, STIs, and mental health that the community health workers were already doing. But I certainly agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name's Sarah Hand. Uh, many thanks to the presenters. It was hugely interesting. I think, um, Karen, you highlighted the issue that um, often in implementation we try and look for a panacea. I was wondering if you or one of the other panel members would like to speak to the issues where you have um, developed an application, if you have been under pressure then to try and see if your application that has been developed for a specific task is then assumed to be able to do other things in, in addition. Um, it'd be great to hear, because I think that you know, we are under pressure as organizations that work on digital interventions to try and find that panacea. Um, thank you very much again for the excellent presentations. Thank you. And I'm sure um, colleagues could speak about it from a data health informatics perspective the same thing keeping adding on adding on it can become quite complicated but from um, the experience from the community-based perspective uh, certainly it is about uh, sometimes being focused and being very clear about our outcomes and intervention strategies you know within implementation science I think it's really important that we clearly define uh, what we think we're doing and what the objectives are for doing that what are the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve uh, and that, of course, fits within an existing program. So I think in terms of a panacea, I, I see it, you know, I think for a lot of the lessons that we've had and, and the boost COAs will speak to it is that um, there is no panacea. It doesn't exist. And I think that's the point. We can create tools. We can test tools. We should make them content content and context relevant. So aligned Ministry of Health and Child Care priorities um, and algorithms and guidelines and also um, to context for the communities that are using them. You know, not develop things that we haven't asked people from the engaged from the very beginning about how they would like it to look, feel, the information within it, is it acceptable, um, and those types of things. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I don't know if my colleague wanted to speak from a data health informatics perspective. Uh, I feel like uh, the way she tackled that was comprehensive. Uh, we get the tailor everything from the community to meet their needs. So we're going to them to the point of care, at least to address what needs to be addressed. So I feel there is still no panacea for that. Thank you. OK, I don't see NMO hands. So colleagues, uh, OK. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, mine is regarding the supply chain presentation that was made. Uh, I realize that um, the presentation is very informative, but my concern is that this was a pilot project, and I think it brought out uh, very good lessons towards enhancing and improving the supply chain system. So from here, what are the next steps regarding the the pilot, are we just leaving it at piloting or is it going full scale? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so maybe to answer what now lies on that, we've shared the, the data, we've given our results, 
to the relevant authorities. So it's now a factor of the policy and decision makers to make a decision whether to adapt or not to adapt. But hopefully they will adapt for upscaling. Thank you. Okay, colleague, uh, in the absence of any additional intervention, I'd uh, like to thank you very much for your audience. And again, I'd like to ask you to join me to give loud applause to our presenters. Uh, and so thank you very much. This session has come to a close. Thank you.